Greetings fellow humans and welcome to the book wormhole. January was not a good month, at least like personal wise, but weirdly enough it was a really good reading month, as in like everything I read I genuinely really liked, so I'm gonna ignore everything else that happened in January and focus on the best parts of the month, which was all the reading I did. The first book I read was The Darkness Outside Us by Elliot Schrafer. This is a young adult science fiction. Spacefarer Ambrose signed on for a solo rescue mission to Jupiter's moon in order to save his sister after her mission to colonize Titan ends in disaster. What Ambrose didn't know is that he isn't alone after all, and that his rival country to his homeland has also sent their own representative for the mission. These two born enemies must learn to work together if they are going to save Ambrose's sister in time. The initial concept of this book was really interesting, and I love an enemies to lovers plot. However, I almost DNF'd this book. Initially, I didn't like Ambrose as a character. I don't need to love a character in order to empathize with them, but I found Ambrose to be kind of vain and entitled and, most annoyingly, really pushy. And what bothered me the most about it was that I didn't understand why he was acting this way either. The book never really clarifies, though eventually his character does move past this stage. I also didn't like the initial chemistry between Ambrose and Kodiak. I found it both awkward and forced, even though I knew going into the book that they were going to get together. This might be a young adult genre specific thing because I've noticed it in other books as well. Upon meeting Kodiak, the author takes a few paragraphs to painstakingly describe Kodiak's body, namely his muscles. To me, that is like introducing a female character and dedicating a whole paragraph to talking about her breasts and curves and how womanly she looks. It just felt so obnoxiously objectifying, and this isn't the first YA men loving men book I've read that has done this, so it's possible it's just like a horny teenager thing. But also, as a reader, I know next to nothing about this character, so why am I forced to ogle him like a piece of meat before getting to know anything about him? So the initial chemistry is entirely based on lust as well as banter, and I honestly had a hard time getting into the romance aspect of the book at the beginning. But as circumstances change in the story, they are more naturally drawn together, and I started to enjoy the book a lot more. I ended up guessing the plot twist, maybe because it is kind of the same plot twist as the movie Moon. I wouldn't be surprised if Moon was inspiration for this book, but to the book's credit, it does take the concept in a different direction. I feel like there's not too much I can say about this book without giving anything away, but once the twist happens, it does start to move in a very different direction. It becomes less adult and more thought-provoking, and a mix of sad and beautiful at times. While most of the book is centered on their ship, we're treated to little bits and pieces of the state of the world, which is largely in the late stages of civilization's collapse, with really only two main countries existing after war has ravaged Earth. And even then, both countries are in something of a cold war with each other. Through Kodiak's history, we get a glimpse of what it looks like to be poor in this world, raised to be nothing more than a tool for his country to use and benefit from. Whereas Ambrose comes from a more entitled, sheltered background because he was born into wealth status. One neat detail I liked about Ambrose's past is that he is one of many surrogate children of this wealthy, influential mother. It's kind of a neat twist on the influential man having loads of offspring, while also making sense since his mother has the money to pay surrogates to have and raise her children. I honestly think once the twist happens and the stakes of the book are entirely altered, this book is a fantastic story worthy of five stars. The romance becomes more believable and heartbreakingly sweet, and the book starts asking heavier questions, ultimately leading to a somber but satisfying conclusion. But I can't ignore how long it took for the book to actually take off and was kind of disappointed by the start in 150 pages, so 
I'm going to have to knock off a star for that. I think for a young adult reader, this book might be perfect to help ease them into heavier science fiction. But for me, I would have liked it to be more consistent from start to finish. And that's entirely based on my own reading preferences. This book was my classic sci-fi pick of the month. My main reading goal for this year is to read at least once classic slash older science fiction each month since I keep accumulating more but not reading them because I'm too focused on newer releases and I'm choosing to define older sci-fi as anything that came out before the 1990s or anything that was published before I was born. Obviously, I still read books from the 90s and 2000s and will continue doing so, but it won't count for my monthly quota. Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick Rick Deckard is an assassin hired to retire androids that have run away from their owners. Being that androids are nearly identical to humans, his work has begun to weigh on him and Rick wants out, but not before one last big job, which will give him enough money to buy a real-life animal to replace the electric sheep he shamefully keeps as a pet. For such a tiny book, there's so much going on world-building-wise. This takes place in a post-nuclear war-destroyed future where most surviving humans have immigrated to a terraformed Mars, and therefore human population on Earth is very few and far in between. Animals no longer live in the wild, and instead what few humans remain keep all types of animals as pets and use them as a sign of social status since they aren't cheap. The main way Rick Deckard is able to distinguish between who is a human and who is an android is through an empathy test. One of the ironies of this test is the expected human response to these questions makes sense for the world that Dick has created, but for someone like me or even someone living in 1968 when this book came out, we probably wouldn't pass this test since our values are a lot different than folks in this world. Things like a complete revulsion at the thought of eating meat from an animal or using leather made from an animal's hide. Which, obviously some people are vegan in our world, but in this book's world, these things are unthinkably wrong. On the same level of murdering another human being. This element both further develops the world building as familiar yet distinctly different, while also setting up this sort of irony that carries throughout the whole book, which I will explain further later. One part that left me uneasy was when Rick becomes sexually involved with an android and her body is described as prepubescent several times. This was such an uncomfortable section to read and the only reason I can think of for why Dick made this character to look this way is to give readers that feeling of discomfort while reading it. To relate to the readers that this is a relationship that is immoral, as it certainly would be considered in this world. In which case, I think he succeeded, but I also find it interesting when the sexual attraction is juxtaposed with the character of Isidore, who is able to empathize with androids out of solidarity without having any sexual feelings towards them. Isidore is someone who, because he scored too low on an IQ test, he has been marked as special, meaning that he isn't allowed to emigrate to Mars, as well as isn't allowed to procreate. Which that last part is eugenics. And overall, he is looked down upon by other humans and society, so naturally he feels some kinship with androids. This was a book I had to take some time after finishing before rating, and I'm glad I did. Overall, I think there's a major intentional irony in the story. Humans have this superiority complex over androids, priding themselves on the one thing that they have that androids don't, and that is being able to empathize, not only with each other, but in particular with animals. Yet the irony comes in when Isidore, a human being, is actually treated worse than animals by other humans for his supposed lack of intelligence, while androids are most notably for being incredibly intelligent. This is a 5-star rating for me because there is such depth to it and it has honestly left me thinking long after I had put it down. The Kingdom by Jess Rothenberg This is a young adult science fiction. 
Anna is a fantasist, a realistic android woman designed to be the perfect princess and face character working and living at an amusement park called the Kingdom, where happily ever after isn't just a promise, it's a role. With no experience of the world outside the theme park, Anna falls in love with one of the humans working at the park, Owen only to be accused and forced to stand on trial for allegedly murdering him. This was a really neat read. I love the obvious inspiration from Disney World, while also imagining a futuristic amusement park and what technologies might be developed for the sole purpose of entertainment, such as hybrid animals or even bringing back extinct animals though not in a Jurassic Park sort of way. The park sounds like a really neat attraction that I fully believe would be magical to experience. The reality of both the kingdom and the story is a lot more grim than the pretty exterior suggests. The ethics of Anna's existence alone is something entirely ignored, let alone how she, along with her sisters or the other princesses, are treated with people taking advantage of them, sometimes physically, and then having the traumatic memories deleted from their minds. One of my favorite parts early on is at the end of the day and Anna is getting ready for bed and nonchalantly she throws in a line about the very ordinary to her step of going to bed is being restrained in bed. <laughs> it really set up what the whole book was going to be like and overall carries throughout with these quietly terrible things happening but told through a rose-tinted lens. Just a style thing though, I didn't like the use of pictures in this book. It looked overall very clumsy, and for a very pretty designed book, it looked cheaply incorporated with stock photos. Also a bit jarring to see these very mundane, real pictures while the story is so fantastical, and almost built this very stylized world in my mind particularly with the character of Eve, who is described as having platinum white hair, and that the horses all have butterfly wings. And then yet, when we're given a picture of her, she's just this normal blonde girl on a regular horse. I wish the photos were either omitted entirely or instead illustrated to match this fantastical world the story set up. The story alternates between Anna's life at the park and her first meet in Owen's and brief snapshots of her later stand in trial for Owen's murder, culminating in the end with these two timelines converging. Overall, I think this is an interesting choice and left me wondering how did Anna end up at this point while well, juxtaposed with her being this friendly sweet person. However, the ending did feel somewhat rushed. The book overall has this very lofty pace to it, allowing readers to sort of wander in this brilliant world, yet strong along with these intermittent bits of the future trial. But once both timelines come together, there's these quick reveals about the world and then it just ends. I think it works as a standalone, but more could have been written as not all plots ended up wrapped up. But overall, this book, pretty much met my expectations and was an enjoyable read, so I gave this one a 5 stars. Wendy Darling by A.C. Wise. This is an adult fantasy, sort of a retelling but also sort of a sequel to Peter Pan. Wendy as an adult has tirelessly worked to put her time in Neverland behind her, until one night she wakes up to find Peter Pan in her daughter's room. After he kidnaps her daughter, mistaking her for Wendy, Wendy must return to Neverland once more to rescue her. This book was so far outside my comfort zone. I understand why people enjoy retellings, but as someone who doesn't usually like the original story of retellings, it's a trend I've had little interest in and I probably wouldn't have picked up this book on my own, but I'm really glad it was recommended to me. While the book has the same notable characters and a recognizable setting, Wise takes the story in her own direction. This time Peter Pan is the villain of this book and Wendy questions her happy moments of childhood in Neverland if they were as happy as she truly remembers. I love that and think that's such a common part of growing up is like remembering different events that happened and being able to view them with different eyes. And sometimes things that didn't feel bad at the time end up being really bad. Peter Pan makes a convincing villain without him coming off as out of character. His main personality trait of refusing to grow up is often considered as charming, but in reality it'd be kind of obnoxious. Peter is a character who always has to win and always have to have things go his way. 
And while he's mostly motivated by fun, his attitude comes off as demanding and sometimes scary how inconsiderate he is towards others. Even after Jane reveals herself to be Wendy's daughter rather than the original Wendy, Peter insists on calling her Wendy to the point where even Jane has started to figure who she is. I was really impressed by the feminism of the story. Taking place in the early 20th century, this book keeps in mind the expectations of the time as Wendy and her brothers grow up. It exposes the limited choices offered to people based on their gender. Wendy as a woman can only hope to marry well and bear children, whereas her brothers barely have more of a choice than that. Michael enlists in the war and comes home traumatized, whereas because John failed their physical to be a soldier, his only option was to find a job and get married. But even Neverland, a land of childhood play, has its own rules divided by gender. Peter didn't allow a child age Wendy to play war with him and her brothers because she is a girl. And Peter insists on Jane cooking dinner for everyone because she's a girl, even though Peter proves to be able to cook perfectly fine himself. The only reason Peter lets Wendy or Jane play with him is because he wants her to play the role of mother. But also, the way Peter treats the Lost Boys comes with separate expectations for them. One that stood out was that Peter would get upset whenever any of the boys would cry, to the point where if one of the Lost Boys were upset, they'd do everything in their power not to show it, out of fear of retaliation. And not just from Peter alone. But because of Peter's attitudes towards it, other Lost Boys have also adapted his ideas and would bully any of the boys who didn't act accordingly. It's so interesting and well done and a brilliant way to expose some of the ways we function and oppress each other as adults, but through child's play. I love how Neverland has its own personality and its physical connection to Peter Pan. Day and night come and go on Peter's whims. And, and one smaller detail I found so charming and magical was how Neverland would alter around the kids to become this perfect plaything, such as footholds appearing in the perfect places while climbing trees. But also both Neverland and Peter managed to be really creepy sometimes, almost turning into a nightmare. I like the LGBT rep and how it's balanced with the time period. There isn't an overwhelming presence of homophobia, and overall these characters are allowed to exist while maneuvering a society that isn't welcome to people who don't follow the norm. I liked how Wendy was asexual and how her asexuality was handled, as well as her partnership with her husband, who is gay, but they still love each other and are good parents together. And also Wendy's close, intimate friendship with her friend, Mary. It's a really cool family dynamic that I'd mostly expect to see in books taking place in a more modern time, but I like that this could happen in the past and still feels like it was believable for the time. I don't usually pick a favorite book of the month, but this was definitely my favorite and that's coming from a month where I genuinely loved everything I read. Five stars for sure. Iron Widow by Ziren J. Zhao this is a young adult sci-fi fantasy and the first in the series. Hundreds of years after the invasion of aliens called the Hunduns, humans have learned to fight back by tapping into their inner key and controlling giant-sized animal-shaped mechas called chrysalis. Each chrysalis requires two people to pilot it, one man and one woman. However, female pilots routinely get killed during battle when their male counterparts sap them of all their energy. After a main character, Wu Zetian, loses her sister after she's murdered by a popular male pilot, Zetian decides to enlist herself in order to exact revenge. While paired up with him during battle, Zetian unexpectedly saps him of all of his energy, leaving him dead upon the end of the battle and earning herself the title Iron Widow. I buddy read this with Michael from Fit to be Read. And we will be doing a live discussion of this book sometime this month on my channel, but you should also check out his channel too because it's got a lot of really great science fiction reviews. I honestly didn't know much about this book going in. I wasn't expecting the world to be so misogynistic in this book, but for a story that is deeply rooted in history, all the misogyny depicted is something that has existed or believably exists. 
details such as the overall treatment of daughter characters, people who don't even get a proper bed in the house because they are only expected to be married off when they come of age, and the main character having bound feet, a terrible practice where women's feet were broken as a child and bound into a tiny shoe size for aesthetic appeal. It really set the tone for what this world is like. Also, I like the realism that comes with Zetian having bound feet and how she is disabled because of this, unable to run at all or even walk without a cane, and even doing so, her feet still bleed. Later on, she only uses a wheelchair. I like that the story always keeps in mind Zetian's limitations, yet she isn't a character you interpret as weak or incapable because of it. I honestly love the world building of the story. It's kind of a patchwork of lots of vivid elements, yet works well together as well as is such a unique combination. Though at times it was difficult to follow, particularly with the magic system, which I never fully got a grasp on, so I think I could benefit from rereading this book. I like the romance in the book, though it did feel brief. This book initially sets up for a love triangle that then becomes a polyamorous relationship, which I just loved, but it also felt like immediately after the three of them became... I can't say thruple sincerely, came together romantically. The story moves along into the final battle and we as readers don't get time with them all together. The ending was kind of unexpected. I definitely guessed a few big reveals in the book, but the last 30 to 40 pages were kind of wild and went in a direction I didn't expect, particularly considering this is the first book in a series, so I'm really curious to see where the story goes after this one. The only thing that initially bothered me about this book was Zetian's personality. I had a hard time understanding how someone so outspoken and defiant could exist in this harshly misogynistic society Zhao created. Like, I understood Zetian's anger and desire to make change. But Zhao very much states that families can and do kill girls for bringing shame to them, even if they are just suspected to have done something shameful to the family. So for me, I had a hard time believing Zetian got this far in life acting the way she does, under those conditions without it literally costing her life. As the story progresses, I came to understand that Zetian is a character that has no self-preservation whatsoever, especially since her main goal was to kill the pilot who killed her sister, fully expecting to be executed afterwards. And after succeeding in doing so and not being dead, everything from that point on is sort of a bonus for her. So I get that. It just doesn't justify how she acts in the beginning of the book. You think because she had this goal to seek revenge, she'd want to stay alive long enough to get the opportunity to do so. In this way, I felt like her character kind of lacked depth and character development. It would have been neat to have seen that character shift from a quietly angry girl who has been waiting on the opportunity for revenge to someone who, now that she has value and can openly rebel, she starts to embrace that more and more. I personally would have found that sort of narrative better relatable just from my own experiences as being a woman. Also, who she was in the beginning of the book very much felt like she believed women were compliant in their own oppression, particularly when she calls out the attitudes of other women characters. Well, I think women can be misogynistic and perpetrate the same harmful patriarchal values that they themselves suffer from onto other women. It did kind of sit with me uneasy that Zetian is never depicted as finding solidarity with other women. All her allies are men in this book, but I do think her attitude might have been intentional. As the story progresses and Zetian learns compassion for other characters, she understands that not everyone is coming from the same circumstances as she. I have a feeling the way Zetian is written because this is a young adult novel and Zhao wanted her to be easily recognizable as a feminist figure while also slipping in some early mistakes of someone's first experience with feminism. It also fits tonally with the book as the story is very much in your face, a sort of war cry call to action. I gave this book five stars and I look forward to reading on in the series. So that was my month in books. 
I don't have much planned for February besides a buddy read of The City of Illusions by Ursula K. Le Guin with Joan from The Rabbit Hole. Let me know how this month went for you and remember to support your local library and shop independent when you can. And until next time, please stay tuned.